King of the Jews. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The word of God for the people of God. May we be doers of God's word, not just here. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity 
who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. You may be seen. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We may we follow Jesus with all we have and all we are. Thank you. You may be seen. A new heart. A fresh start. I had someone in a church I served in Iowa who was the manager of a gym. He said at the beginning of the year they made two-thirds of their income. People signed up, they paid, he said the, the first two weeks were insane, absolutely packed, hour by hour, minute by minute, and by mid-February the place was empty. But he still got his money. We make resolutions or goals. We want to do and be better than we are. But we're not always very good at following through with that. One of my least favorite authors in high school was Ellen Montgomery and the Green Gables. We boys were tortured by reading romance novels for detailed essay exams by a teacher who loved everything Ellen Montgomery. And um, over the years, I've been able to purge my mind of most of it. <laughs> but why like anyone would ever read romance novels beyond me. <laughs> yes, I know I'm, they sell millions, so I'm. But there was one quote worth remembering to me. And Anne, who is this troubled teen girl, talked about each day being a fresh start with no mistakes in it. And that's a wonderful attitude. It goes along with scripture. Psalm, the psalmist David talked about God's grace being new every morning. For Methodists, the first 200 years, the biggest high holy day of the year, the day that you never missed, was New Year's Eve. Christmas and Easter were great celebrations, but they did what was called a watch night. They spent the entire night at church. And four hours of that was a very intense prayer service. John, it began when John Wesley and a few of the others in leadership did that. And they felt God's presence move in a powerful way. They looked at scripture in the book of Acts and other places when God's people get to, got together and spent time together praying and fasting and pleading with God. They saw that that was the way that God spoke. And for generations, God did. I served a couple churches that still have watch night services. Usually it's more of fun and games until about 11, then a service ending with communion at midnight. Maybe someday I'll try it here and see if anybody joins me. But um, it was so important because it was felt that God would speak and guide for the next year. Guide the person, guide the church, guide the community. The Magi, wise men, whatever you want to call them, were also looking for a fresh start. To journey two years. If you were listening to what Don said, Herod killed the baby boys two years and under based on the time the star appeared. 
If you also notice when he said the map, I know it's so cute to have the wise men at the stable. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but um, the scripture talks about that they're at the house. So this is after. This is not the same time as the shepherds. Um, but it doesn't ruin, it doesn't take away from the beautiful symbolism of the, uh, the nativity scene. But they traveled for two years. The Magi, or those that were studying, were probably from Persia, now Iran, by camel, up and down the mountains and the deserts, the bandit trails. Jesus was born in the Roman Empire. Persia, then, um, depending on what part, it might have been called Parthia or Sassanid. It de depends on where we don't know exactly where they were. But they were enemies of Rome. Herod was likely to see them and execute them, as he was to greet them with open arms. Because their nation were perpetually at war with the Roman Empire. What would compel wealthy people to travel two years? They would run months without baths. There was not enough water in the desert to bathe. Persians on the mountains are clean people who bathe constantly. Most, a lot of Persia was in the northern and cool mountain area, not the hot desert. But they were looking for something. They traveled two years, worshiped Jesus, gave their gifts. The gold, frankincense, and myrrh were God's provision for taking care of them in Egypt when the Holy Family had to flee. They made the fresh start. Joseph is someone that doesn't get a lot of press in Scripture. He's last mentioned when Jesus is 12. Tradition says that he died before Jesus started, was baptized by John and started preaching. There's no real historic record from that time. They didn't do death certificates. But he disappears from the scripture after between the, the 18 years between Jesus at the temple at 12 and begins preaching at 30. Joseph was on a mission. His mission was to keep Mary and Jesus safe to provide Jesus the um, training and experience of being a carpenter and to help shape God's son. He answered God's call. As I have mentioned, Shirley Wilson, that Jewel's mother, is one of those people that just impresses me so much. Because she didn't wait. A lot of times people will grieve the loss of a child for years and years and years, and then maybe 10 years later, start to do something positive or hopeful. That's more than normal. Uh, that's to be expected. That's what is. But somehow God gave her the strength to do what almost nobody can and almost immediately begin pouring into, that's a neighborhood of Fort Wayne that I wouldn't walk in after dark. <laughs> I grew up in South Bend, I've been mugged twice, once at Nine Point, once at Gunpoint. There's areas I have little interest in going to. And that part of Fort Wayne is one of them. <clears throat> when I went to the banquet, not when they came here, but there was a, a banquet, um, for you or Wilson later in the winter that I went to. And one of the stories told was by a man who had a gun and was going to go, he, um, somebody owed him some money, he cheated him, he was going to go shoot and kill him. And as he drove by the Ewell Wilson Center where he'd gone as a kid, God hit him upside the head. And he went in and handed him the gun. And God saved him from prison and whoever he was going to kill from death. Because the memories and the conviction and the power. God uses broken people.
one of my heroes is Nehemiah. Nehemiah went from being number two to the king. But God called him to go to a broken city and rebuild the walls and the community of Jerusalem. By the way, I hope beyond hope that all of you know me well enough to know that comments about building the wall are, have nothing to do with politics or anything like that. That was another world, another time, another place, and that is not remotely um, where I'm going. So don't start throwing candles. This is a, uh, not about that. But um, he goes and rebuilds the broken walls that protect the city from the, the bandits, from the wild animals, from the enemies, from the attacks. He leaves the first finest and found for the least last and lost, a homeland he's never seen, but that his parents were from. It has been my calling as pastor to help see different times, different places, broken lives and broken walls heal. Nehemiah was able to step forward in faith because he was willing to hear God's call. Most of us If we heard my family's good section English Canadian, before that, from England. If England is attacked, I feel bad, but I don't think about getting on a plane and going over there to help them rebuild. Nehemiah was powerful when he heard his homeland was devastated. A land he had never seen. It had been so easy for him to think, wow, that's really too bad. Dear God, send someone to help them. Here, here's some gold coins. And that would be okay. But he let God break his heart for those people in that land that was defenseless. And he wept and he prayed until God moved and God stirred. When will we let God break our hearts for hurting people? For a hurting community? Some of you know I did suicide intervention for 10 years. I was contacted uh, a few days before Christmas by one of the organizations I worked with pleading with me to come be involved again because the suicide rates are endemic. And it's often not the poor, desperate people. The people, the ones that you would figure didn't have any groceries in the house and didn't have a job and didn't know what to do. It's often people that look like they have their lives together. Many have given up with no purpose. Because if your purpose in life is to be the one that dies with the most toys, what's the point? Our culture has forgotten eternity and has forgotten God. You let God break your heart and hear what he's calling you to do. After God called Nehemiah, he had to figure out what needed to be done. He went and looked at the city and came up with a plan. Then he rallied the people. Then he removed the rubble. They built, they fought, they encouraged and discouraged, they built and they celebrated. Our vision team, one of our primary goals this year for the church is for us to go deeper in faith. And you'll 
hear more about different ways to grow in faith. Whether that be Bible school or Sunday school, um, there's a neat visual aid we'll be trying how to grow deeper and become more like Jesus. God's call is always for something big enough to scare you. If it doesn't scare you, it's not really God's call, my dear. I can't find a single example in, in the Bible. I can't find one. Maybe I missed it. Tell me. Prove me wrong. I can't find one example where God called someone and they said, oh, piece of cake. All right, let's go. It was always, I can't do that. Are you crazy? God, is this really you, God? This is bigger than me. That's the whole point. In a world that's forgetting God, calling to remember or to meet him the first time to bring hope and healing is bigger than us. Some of you I know better than others. Some I know a little of your circumstances, your struggles. Others of you I've not yet gotten the privilege to know terribly well. I know some of you have had an absolutely horrible year. That things in your life that matter desperately have been shattered and broken. I know some of you have had a wonderful year. And most of us probably are somewhere in between. As we come to a new year, a fresh start, God calls us like the wise men to go. To go on a journey. A journey to follow him. When they followed that star, they didn't know where they were going to go. I'm not the most detailed person in the world, as you probably have figured out if you ever worked with me. But I'm detailed enough that if I'm going to get in the car, I want to know where I'm going. Usually put in the GPS or a map, let alone a two-year journey just to follow a star. That was just as crazy then as it is now. Every bit as insane. These were educated, powerful, important people who were not accustomed to getting on a camel and following a, a star into the wilderness. Following God, following Jesus can be scary. Giving him our hurts. That person that's hurt us and we want to hit them back with everything we have and instead we say, God, help me forgive. Placing our life in his hands. terrifying moment for me as a parent of each of my children's baptisms. Giving them to God. I want to take them back all the time. Because it's scary. Because bad things happen to good people. Yes, God can take better care of them than I can, but it's the human condition to try to want to be in control. However you come, however you are, Broken and battered, weary and worn, or rejoicing and on top of the world. I will treasure a memory from this past week for the rest of my life. Timmy and William coming down, almost crashing, squealing at the top of their lungs. I'm sure you heard it here. Um, heard, it, heard it in China. Um, and the, the joy and silliness and delight. And when we can bask in God's presence like children and enjoy. As a father enjoys my children's joy, our father enjoys ours. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in love and forgiveness with each other. But there's a problem, because we don't often seek to live in love and forgiveness with each other. 
We scream at strangers over the internet over politics. Some, some do anyway. We get angry because the clerk takes too long. We grouch at our children. We decide the TV program is more important than the scriptures. Let's confess our sins before God. Almighty God, we confess that we have failed to be an obedient church, an obedient people. We've not done your will, we've broken your law, we've rebelled against your love. We've not heard the cry of the needy, the broken, the lost. Forgive us, we pray. For the sake of your Son, Jesus, have mercy on us. Lord, in the moment of silence which will follow, if there is someone we need to forgive, may we forgive them. If there is someone we need to seek forgiveness from, may we purpose to do it. If there's sin in our life, may we confess it. And if we're carrying a burden too big for us, may we lay it down before your blood-stained, blood-soaked, holy, rugged cross. Speak to us now in the silence. 